welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you as a public service by the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover. Have you ever thought about what it takes in terms of personal courage to survive a crisis? Is the answer found in love? Is it strength or is it irrepressible humor? On 9-11, Marion Fontana lost her husband, Dave, a firefighter in the World Trade Center. In her book, A Widow's Walk, she takes us through this horrible tragedy. So joining me today is Marion Fontana, an accomplished comedian, an actress, a writer, and president of the 9-11 Widows and Victims Families Association. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Also joining me today is Michael L. Coyne, the Associate Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Mike, thank you again for being with us. Thanks, Di. And I'm Diane Sullivan, your host for today's program. Mike, as you know, Marion Fontana will give the commencement address and receive an honorary degree at our 17th annual commencement exercises here at the Massachusetts School of Law. Can you tell me why was Marion chosen? Well, for her, for her many accomplishments, first of all. But, uh, you know, a lot of schools, Diane, try to get bring in a famous actor or an actress or someone who really hasn't accomplished a lot but is what popular culture thinks is famous. Um, we looked at Marion as someone who really was faced with some of life's greatest, uh, ad, uh, you know, obstacles and nonetheless be able to take it and survive and not just survive but really accomplish a lot for a lot of people. She uh, was instrumental in much of the victims work at 9-11, uh, making sure that the firefighters and their families and those left behind uh, received uh, w what would be just compensation. Uh, continues to this day to try and ensure that the right thing is done uh, at the World Trade Center site. And as anyone might guess, there are so many other constituencies and interests there, it's not an easy job. Um, and for someone who could have, frankly, just packed it in and said, you know, no more, I can't do this, um, and, and become a further victim herself, I think, and I think many of us here at the Mass School of Law think that it's, it's a lesson to us all as to how we should try to live, is that um, you try to make the best out of all situations and really try to persevere and accomplish. Um, and I think this, your story is really inspirational and it's, uh, it's a good philosophy that we all could uh, use to live our lives by. So okay. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Do you see Marion as a role model? Oh, I sure do. I mean, I think philosophically, uh, if, you, if you talk to her, you'd recognize is that a lot of people see themselves as victims when they may not be or it may be uh, centuries ago or it may be a short history where they've, they've suffered some adversity. But, but here, this is a, uh, probably the, one of the worst things that could happen to anyone, to happen to her and, and her son. Um, and to instead of um, becoming further victimized by these horrendous actions, decides to help others, uh, decides to push forcefully uh, on behalf of others. I mean, especially as a law school, and even though she's <laughs> not a lawyer, and maybe just uh, because she's not a lawyer, she was able to advocate uh, for that group that otherwise would not have received um, what they, what at, le at the minimum that they should be entitled to get. So a role model in many, many ways. I'm very pleased that the school has chosen to honor her um, at our commencement. As am I. Mike, she is also an example of some of the heroines and heroes that sit in our cla law classes every day. See, I think that's sort of the interesting thing that, that hopefully uh, Marion symbolizes is that we, we tend to look for the people on the, those fancy TV shows and all the rest as to they're our heroes because we have to pay $10 a, <laughs> a, a whack to see them in the theaters. But there are many, many firefighters and police officers and uh, other public servants who day in and day out serve us well, but since they are beside us in a classroom or come have a barbecue with us and a beer, that we don't look at them as heroes and heroines. A and I think that says something about our culture, but I think it says a lot about us that we were fortunate that she would come and be recognized today because she actually symbolizes not just her own um, success, but hopefully the success of a lot of people that go unnoticed on a day-to-day -day basis. Well said. Marion, I'd like to read a passage from your book. You say, on September 11th, I dropped my son off at his second full day of kindergarten. The sky was so blue, it looked as if it had been ironed. 
I crossed the street, ordered coffee, and sat to wait for my husband to meet me. It was our eighth wedding anniversary, and Dave and I were about to begin a new chapter in our 17 years together. Sipping coffee, I watched as a line of thick black smoke crept across the sky from Manhattan, oblivious to the fact that my life was about to change forever. Marion, take us back to that morning. Um, it was, you know, a pretty average morning. Um, it was my son's second day of kindergarten, so I was rushing around because I woke up late. <laughs> so it was a very difficult day. And um, I was trying to hurry him along, and Dave called, and um, I was excited because it was our anniversary, and he had, you know, got the day off, and we were going to go into the city and go to a museum and out to lunch, and, you know, that was rare for us to be able to do that. So we were really excited, and he called, and... Um, he said, I'm, I'm ready to go, which means that someone's come in to replace him. And I said, are you really ready to go? Because, you know, sometimes uh, it takes a while for him to leave. Um, but he said, nope, I'm showered. I'm ready to go. I'll meet you in, in 10 minutes. So we agreed to meet in 10 minutes at the muffin shop. And um, I dropped my son off and bumped into a friend and started chatting and realized I was going to be late and ran over thinking that he'd been waiting and when he wasn't there... I was very surprised, but, you know, sat and waited, and and then I saw that plume that you mentioned in <coughs> that excerpt, and, you know, there was a lot of chatter, and I heard a plane um, had crashed into the towers, and, you know, I pictured a little Cessna or something, and kind of rolled my eyes going, oh, God, I hope he didn't go, because he loved big fires or a big event, and then, um, you know, I, I got annoyed initially thinking that he might go. and um, But then I said, no, he wouldn't go because our anniversary is probably at home. And, and when I got home um, and it was no one, there was no one there and I turned on the TV as we all did that morning, I was shocked to see what was happening. Tell us what it was like the next few weeks and it takes about two weeks before you realize that Dave is dead. Well, I, I knew it immediately. Um, I, you know, everyone around me thought I was crazy, but I, I really felt like a plug had been pulled. Um, I just knew as soon as I saw that first tower fall that he was in there, and I just felt it in my bones. And, you know, I collapsed to the floor, and I was crying, and all my friends were like, we don't even know. He's probably in a tunnel. There's traffic, and because he came from Brooklyn. And um, so all my friends that rushed over, you know, thought I was, really jumping the gun thinking that and you know then I had people calling saying they thought he s they saw him you know covered in dust at the site and so there was a lot of chaos and a lot of waiting I think the waiting was probably the the hardest part um, you know just pacing the rugs waiting for calls I, I couldn't that was probably the hardest and longest day of my life definitely and friends from all over the neighborhood started to come. My parents couldn't come because they couldn't get over the bridge. All the bridges had shut down. So mm -hmm. it was mostly my friends in the neighborhood. Um, and we started calling emergency rooms all over the tri-state area, hoping that, you know, he'd be there. And they were all empty. And so I knew something really bad had happened and that, you know, he probably wouldn't come home. But it was a lot of waiting. It was, um, you know, his family insisted that he could be um, alive. The firefighters, some of them really felt like he could be alive. So there was a lot of, you know, inner turmoil over whether I should believe what I innately knew was true or to kind of have hope that, you know, um, there might be some glimmer of hope that he would be buried or, you know, um, alive in the rubble. Um, and so I, you know, just prayed. I prayed like I've never prayed. I happen to live in the borough of churches, so that was easy. I, I, didn't, I think I went into temples. I don't even know where I went. But, you know, I dropped to my knees pretty much everywhere and prayed and prayed and prayed. And, and then after two weeks, I knew it was kind of futile. How did you feel when you came to that realization? Um, well, it wasn't a new feeling because I mm -hmm. kind of was living there anyway. But, you know, I just had like this little glimmer of maybe um, just based on what I've other people were saying. Mm -hmm. But innately in my heart, like I said, in that moment I saw the tower fall, I kind of knew. Um, but it, it seemed hopeless. I mean, there, I saw the firefighters' faces when they were coming back from the pile, and I knew they were not telling me that it was as bad as it was. Um, there were a few that were candid and said, man, there's just no way anyone's going to be found alive in there. It's, you know... 10 stories of rubble compressed, you know, 105 stories and 10 stories. It's, there's no way anyone could survive that. So I knew, I really knew that it was, there was no hope, but, um, you know, just kind of shifted from hoping that he'd be alive um, to hoping that he'd be found at all. 
because I knew it was bad and that, you know, if they found anything, he probably wouldn't be in one piece. So then my hope shifted to, you know, hoping that he'd be found altogether. And then that didn't look good, so then I just hoped that I'd find something at all. Yeah. Marion, in your book you say that 9-11 grieving was exhausting. What yeah. do you mean? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think grieving in general, I mean, the shock and, you know, the pain and trying to wrap your head around the whole event just was so hard and, and physically was exhausting. You know, just crying that much during a day. I was sore. I was, you know, not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And it was really exhausting. And then, you know, there was this kind of um, people around you that would trigger you crying, you know. So it was, it was exhausting because it was public, you know, that I had thousands of friends and neighbors and a family descending upon me, which was, oh, you know, wonderful, but also very overwhelming and very exhausting. And, you know, I called it, I think I said it was sitting Shiva for, you know, a month <laughs> in my house just waiting to get word. So it was, it, that was hard. Mike, your reaction? Yeah, I mean, what I was thinking, and that's what I, I wanted to ask you, ask you actually, is how do you, how do you get past the anger? Um, and there had to be a fair amount of anger at some point with, I mean, it's on your anniversary, you've mm -hmm. got plans, you yeah. shouldn't even have been working at that point. How do you get past the anger and, and, and make something positive out of it, something so tragic? Um, you know, it's funny. Every, you know, everyone, I think, deals with loss in a different way, and anger was just not my resounding emotion. I don't know why. I, I really wish I knew, but um, I've never really gotten angry. I think I got mad once at a reporter who asked me to sit and watch Bin Laden, you know, revel in his attack. And that's the only time I got mad. I didn't even get mad at Bin Laden. I got mad at the reporter <laughs> who asked me. So, I, you know, anger is just not a place I, I like to live. I mean, I really just felt nothing but sadness. I mean, there were times when, you know, I looked up at the sky and was like, why did you do this to me, you know, and, and felt sorry for myself. But in general, it was not sadness and it was just kind of my resounding emotion at that time. What was it like to be the wife of a firefighter before 9-11? Hmm. Um, I don't recommend it. <laughs> 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 it's a really hard life. It's, um, it's great in some ways in that they have the time to, you know, he had time to be with my son during the day, um, you know, and really, you know, he was probably more present in Aiden's life than I was because I was working um, you know, they have, they work great shifts so they can have three days off in a row and, you know, in that way the job's wonderful. He, it's also wonderful because he loved it. I mean, very few people go to work and are excited to go to work and he was every day. Um, so it's a great job in that, but for a wife, um, you know, to worry, you know, I went gray very young. <laughs> I think <laughs> you wouldn't know it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I went gray very young and, and you worry, you know, you, I worried about him all the time. I really did. And I never kind of got complacent about it either. Yeah. I just kind of felt like we never left angry. That was kind of a rule that we had, that if he went off to work and we had an argument or something before, that we'd have to resolve it before and, or call each other up and say we were sorry because it just, you know, there was that threat that, you know, he could be hurt or killed or, you know, and it was very, you know, present in our lives, so. Which is a good lesson for all of us. Yeah, it forces you to live in the moment in, in a way that you probably wouldn't had he, you know, been a stockbroker or something. <laughs> do, do you think he recognized the danger every day he went out? Or, I mean, sometimes some of the, the folks that are involved in uh, public safety activities like that really sort of put it in the back of their mind and don't see the, mm. the pr always present danger. Um, I think in the beginning, because he was young, and I think when you're young you have a mm -hmm. kind of uh, invulnerable feeling that you're, uh, you know, can survive anything. Um, in the beginning, I think he really didn't think about it too much. And then, um, actually, ironically, on June, on, on Father's Day, right before he died, there was a big fire, an Astoria fire, where three firefighters were killed, and he was there. And his kind of mentality was, if I train hard and I work hard and I really um, pull up my boots and I don't, you know, I'm by the book, uh, a good firefighter, then nothing can happen to me. And what happened at this fire is a wall just collapsed. The guys were just standing there. And it really had nothing to do with their training. These were guys that had, you know, 15, 20 years on the job. And he realized it's random and I can die. And I think it really shook him up and made him reevaluate um, his job and how, how hard it is. And 
And then, ironically, when I was moving, um, I found a note in his journal from when he was in Proby school, um, where uh, Proby had been killed at a fire, and he was questioning, I think, for the first time, this you know job he was entering, and and he, I think, it closed with, and in the end, I do God's work, and if God chooses me to leave sooner than I want to, then then so be it. So that's how he felt about it. You know, the other thing I think a lot of times the people think is the stereotype of the firefighter or the policeman is just sort of a very one-dimensional mm -hmm. person. Uh, your husband was much more than a one-dimensional <laughs> uh, person. Yeah, I, he was, uh, he had a lot of dimensions and straddled a lot of different worlds. He was a sculptor. When I met him in college, I never planned on being a firefighter's wife, actually. Um, so he was an art major and we lived in the arts dorms together and that's where we met. And um, he had a, he was a huge history buff, read, read every book about history and and then incorporated that into firefighting and he had started to research all the firefighters that had died in World War II that were sent off and were never really honored. Um, so he started to research and, and go through the daunting task of trying to get plaques dedicated in all the firefighters, firehouses where they served. So he had started that process, he had done his um, first firehouse and had a big ceremony um, for the guys that had perished and their families, and it was a beautiful thing. So yeah, he had, he had a lot of dimensions. Mike, in the minute or so before we take a break, we have in our law classes a lot of firefighters and other public servants, police officers and the like. Are they inspirational to the young law students that sit in class among them? I hope so, Di, because I sometimes worry that uh, even my own children, they go from high school to college to wherever uh, without recognizing the sacrifices that, that others ha are making on their behalf. And so uh, classrooms like these where the, average, the age can range from 22 to 52, and it can range from people directly out of college to people who have had very successful careers in other fields, uh, offers an opportunity to get a really very wide range of opinions and a wide range of experiences in that classroom. So, so I hope they, they take to heart what other people have to say and how hard they've worked to be able to achieve some of the things that they've achieved. And so I hope that. And I hope my own children think about some of the sacrifices others make on their behalf. We need to take a break. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Educational Forum, where we're discussing 9-11 with Marion Fontana. Two weeks after 9-11, the city of New York attempts to close your husband's fire squad. That ignites you into an activism mode, and ultimately, that's the birth, as I understand it, of the 9-11 organization that you're president of. Tell us why you were so enraged when they wanted to close the fire station and what you did about it. Well, um, I was shocked actually. I was just sitting at home and I was, since I was the only widow who lived in the neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. the firemen called me and they said, we heard that um, we just, it's been announced that they're closing squad and we're all being dispersed around Manhattan. And my immediate reaction was uh, just, no, they can't do that. You know, I hadn't cleaned Dave's locker out. The firehouse was um, a source of information for me and a lot of the community that was coming there. And it was really a place where I was grieving with the firefighters that we were kind of really connecting. And, you know, um, it was just a place f for all um, at that moment. The, all the firehouses in New York kind of became second homes for people at that time. So it just felt really wrong for it to be closing. And I immediately got angry. I immediately started making phone calls. I started making posters. I said, we're going to rally. Um, we're going to do something because I can't sit by and let that happen. And it wasn't anything planned. Um, in fact, I had stayed up almost all night writing these flyers to get people to come to this rally. And by the time I took my son to school that morning, there were already flyers all over the neighborhood. I had made two phone calls to two moms at my son's school, and they had called two people, and they had called two people. And before I knew it, the whole neighborhood had turned out um, in mass to try to keep the firehouse open because they felt as strongly as I did that it was not right. And so. 
um, I spoke at this rally. It happened to be an election day as well, which helped. So <laughs> all the politicians, mm -hmm. celebrities in the neighborhood showed up, media, and called attention to that. And, and by, I guess, about by 7 o'clock, they said, okay, we're going to keep it open. And, um, and it was kind of a funny ending with a chief that um, had come to announce the closing you know, asked me to leave the room when he spoke to the firefighters to tell them that it would stay open. They're like, no, she's a firefighter. She's staying here with us. And so I sat there and I was like, thanks, guys. I was very honored and very moved that they were having me stay there. And he said, we're going to keep the firehouse open. And I said, what about the men? Are they going to stay together? And he kind of looked around and they're like, yeah, what about the men? Are we going to get to stay together? And he's like, I can't promise that. And they, And then I said, you know, if anything like this happens again, even remotely, if you try to send these men away, I will tr double the amount of people that show up because I only had a little time to organize. <laughs> <laughs> and all the guys started clapping and, you know, they were like, okay, we got the message. And and then he said, now can we go across the street for a drink because it's my birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt terrible. I'd been so mean to him, but, uh <laughs> <laughs> but it got the job done. And then the next thing I knew, you know, there were families calling me saying, do you know what's happening at the site? Um, and just issue after issue began to arise, and I really saw that there was a need for communication that was not taking place with for the families. And you know, I suddenly just started making phone calls to politicians, and the next thing I knew, I was you know in uh, meetings with them, trying to communicate to the families, and starting a website so the families would have a place to go and find out things. And it just snowballed; it became bigger than me before I even knew it. So that's how it all began. There's a point you talk about in your book where Mayor Giuliani decides to cut the firefighters from ground zero. Once again, you're ignited into an activism mode. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, I received a call from, again, from one of the firefighters at the house, and they said, you know, they just cut all the firefighters at the site. And I went, what? You know, they can't. And they said, it's all right, we're going to handle it. We're having a protest tomorrow. And I'm like, well, I'm coming. And they said, no, 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 let, let the guys handle this. We'll, you know, we'll do it. Uh, they went down uh, that morning. I, the next morning, I woke up and I turned on the TV, and they were showing firefighters fighting with police officers. And I immediately called my friend. I said, "You call this handling it? What are you guys doing down there?" And they said, "No, it was just guys in the front that um, young police officers had been asked to stop us, and we couldn't go on the site where all our friends are, you know, buried under rubble." And and of course, it started a fight. And I said, "Okay, I understand." And about I think there were about 12 firefighters that had been arrested and. It was a mess, and so I called the mayor, and he very graciously agreed to meet me that next morning, uh, or that next evening in a meeting, and I just grabbed a few widows, <laughs> and we showed up, and we just kind of made the case that, you know, it was very important that the firefighters be there, not just for us, but for this kind of code of honor in the fire department that says that no man leaves his brother behind um, on, at the site, and that was very important for them to be there, and that they were trained to be there. His issue was that there was a safety issue, and mm -hmm. we kind of made the claim that they had been there for, you know, a month, and not one person had been injured. So that kind of made us just, you know, made uh, reinforced my position, <laughs> and we were able to put them back on the site. Mike, is this the type of activism we try to train young law students to engage in? We do. Um, let me tell you about a, a brief exchange I had with a student the other day. Uh, he was saying to me, you know, I know I can't expect to leave law school and change the world. And it took me aback for a minute because the fact is law students should leave law school and expect to change the world. They have, I think, a very serious responsibility to fight injustice in their communities and to really go out and speak for people whose voices might not otherwise be heard. And so uh, I hope, I know our graduates uh, engage in that on a daily basis, and I hope others uh, do as well. And I hope more people um, recognize the power of their own voice. And you know, Marion was able to band a group of people together and have their voices heard. And I would hope that more college graduates, more law school students would recognize that uh, their voices can be very, very powerful on their own, but when they're able to put a group together, uh, the voices become even more powerful. Marianne, tell us a little bit about some of your meetings with some of the major politicians that we know about, whether it be Mayor Giuliani or Hillary Clinton. Um, well, um, Giuliani had a, a number of 
uh, meetings with right after that meeting I just mentioned, and he was always very receptive and um, funny, actually. He, ha he had a great sense of humor, and he felt very much that the firefighters were his employees that he had lost personally and was very proactive in trying to help the families um, that had suffered their loss. So he was very open-minded and, and receptive to a lot of the not the demands, but the requests we were making of him about more information about the site slowing down, the recovery um, operation changing a little bit. Um, and I showed up all at all hours. I called him at all hours, and he was always pretty receptive. Um, Hillary Clinton I met later um, af when we were dealing with the victim's compensation bill. She kind of uh, did a couple of press conferences about the statutes um, and some of the limitations that were put on it that she was opposed to and the families were opposed to, and so she was able to advocate for us as well. And she was very receptive. I actually met her at a bill signing down in Washington, and I was very impressed with her kind of poise in the middle of, you know, a lot of um, people giving her a hard time. She was very uh, poised and able to articulate what we needed, which was great. Um, I probably was most impressed by Elliot Spitzer, um, who was is Attorney General in New York, and he and I don't know if it was because he was a lawyer or what, but he was able to really advocate for the families in a way that nobody else could in, in terms of articulating what we really needed um, it, with the victim's compensation bill and how it was limited. Um, I had trouble articulating that because I don't care about money too much, but I knew there were um, families that were being um, treated badly through this these limitations and he was able to articulate it to the to the um, governor and to um, Kenneth Feinberg and able to really make a case for us that we probably would have had a hard time making on our own. So he was wonderful. Can I, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Most of us would find kind of daunting having to have an exchange with Hillary Clinton or Rudy Giuliani or Elliot Spitzer. Yeah. What do you think in your training or your background gave you really the ability to to deal with them as effectively as you were able to? Um, well, I, you know, I was an actress, but I really don't think that came into play as because I, I really feel that it was just this time in my life where I didn't care. <laughs> 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 I just felt like I had lost everything, and I felt like I hadn't, I didn't have anything to lose. So all those things that um, elevate people to their fame, just I didn't care. You know, I, if I was talking to the president or you know my son, it felt the same to me in terms of. You know, I was just operating on a f an instinctual level that I I wouldn't even know how to reproduce <laughs> now <laughs> if I tried. But um, I, you know, they were just human beings who could get what I needed. I wanted my husband home, and I wanted him, you know, whatever. If there was something to be recovered, I wanted it recovered well, and that was my mo. And I didn't care who I needed to speak to to make that happen. It just kind of was important that it just happened, and so I was able to articulate that to them and, and, you know, they, I didn't really care who they <laughs> were. <laughs> I was, you know, that stuff actually has never really, I mean, I'm impressed in when, I'm more impressed by the, by firefighters and teachers and people who work with, you know, handicapped children. I'm more enamored of that than I am. I would probably be dumbfounded by talking to someone like that than I would be uh, to someone okay. famous. <laughs> Tell us about some of your dark days and what you refer to in your book as your tantrums inside and how you got through all that. Um, oh, I had a lot of them. Um, well, I realized that there were times to cry and there were times where I could just couldn't publicly. Um, I didn't like crying in front of my son because I think it really mm -hmm. made him feel like his whole world was going to crumble. And so it was important to, you know, hold myself together, however loosely stitched that was sometimes. and. Um, so a lot of the times I would kind of get pent up almost and then would have this kind of rush at the end of the day or in the evening when I, everything would just kind of descend on me. It doesn't swell as much <laughs> and it's a good place to just let it go and I did, I cried a lot in those times and you know I think when you're alone it's just a whole different thing than when you're out in public and trying to you know stay poised and together and, and hold it in. Um, but I, I cried a lot publicly also. I mean, there were some, some 
you know, some press things where I couldn't hold it together, and I cried openly at a few of them. You know, I, I didn't like to and I didn't want to, but, you know, sometimes I just couldn't help it. <laughs> so. Marianne, tell us about the lack of information coming from ground zero, from the firefighter boots to your own internal investigation, if you will. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty shocking, actually. Um, I mean, it, I was shocked to see the firefighter walking around with taped boots because the heat from the fires they were walking on were so intense that their boots were melting and that they didn't, there was all this bureaucratic paperwork they had to go through to get new boots and stuff like that that was just, you know, dumbfounded. I was just dumbfounded by all of that. Um, that there was, you know, the city was still trying to operate the way it used to, <laughs> you know. So that was upsetting. And then, you know, hearing reports back from different people um, about how the site was being handled, it became a, a power struggle between different entities, um, the, you know, um, the Department of Design and Construction wanted to control the site, the firefighters wanted to control the site, and I really wasn't interested in who was controlling the site. I wanted it to just slow down and be done reverently and uh, in the way it was supposed to. So that was kind of frustrating and, and to get information from everybody that was clear and, and really get a good idea that w of what was happening at the site was difficult. But I managed to have a few key people that could kind of report back to me about what was happening, if there were problems, um, and then try to get that information to the families. What happened was that information took so long to get mm -hmm. to the families that a lot of times that rumors, you know, would start and then families would just be so upset by the time um, anything actually was told to them. For example, you know, there were rumors that um, seagulls were flying off with body parts from fresh kills where all the debris was being brought and then, you know, sifted through out in Staten Island at a, at a landfill. So um, that was disturbing. Then I got a secret phone call from somebody who said, you know, there's body parts at, the s at fresh kill all over the place and nobody's attending to them. There's boots that smell like, you know, human flesh. You have to um, go investigate. And so then I became kind of an undercover cop and, and snuck onto the site um, disguised as a delivery person and looked for myself to see if there was anything happening. And there was, you know, turnout gear in the mud and, and things weren't being handled well. And so then I could report back to the mayor and say, I was there and I saw this. And and he would say, okay, let's change that and put more people down at um, Fresh Kills to watch. And, and that's really kind of how it all unfolded. Mike, your reaction? It, it's just really astonishing, I think, sometimes to, to those of us somewhat removed from the scene uh, to, to recognize some of the stories that we, we haven't heard about. Um, one of the things we mentioned just uh, a little while ago is that all the rescue workers now who are seriously ill as a result mm. of their activities, mm. I mean, I think that's another area that we really haven't been made aware of. How, how did the rescue workers fare after 9-11? Uh, well, um, badly. I mean, some of them, some of them are fine, and a lot of them are getting sick. Um, out of the 30 men in my husband's firehouse, 12 were killed, and then another four were put on what they call light duty because of lung issues and breathing issues. Um, some people, amazingly, were not affected by being there at the recovery every day, but most of them uh, are having problems that are showing up now, and that was really that's really been a problem in that. If you had a problem, you had to report it immediately, within 24 hours, and that just isn't how this is working, that a lot of the stuff they inhale, the asbestos and stuff, shows up later, and that's what they're finding now, and a lot of them are getting sick, and unfortunately, some of them are dying, and it's very upsetting to think about that. And it's not just firefighters, no. it's really a policeman, it's anyone who came to try and assist with some of the rescue efforts. Yeah, that's really this, the tragedy on top of the tragedy is that, you know, you had people driving down from all over the country, you know, we had firefighters from all over the country, but also civilians that just came and wanted to help, and they stayed at the site, and they gave water to the recovery workers, or they got supplies that were needed, and they were breathing in those toxins also, and and they're getting sick. I just got an email from a volunteer from the site who um, lost her job. She was a lawyer. She lost her job because she's having physical 
problems after physical problems and she couldn't show up to work and she eventually had to leave her job and now is losing her apartment and I mean she was a, a very successful lawyer and she did this kind deed and now she's really struggling so that's a common story happening now. She had not the no, I, I, I think we should fully support them the way they supported us. I mean, I, I, I feel a bit helpless. Um, I've been trying to reach out to politicians and finding out what can be done, but it's, it's difficult because of the way the laws are set up and the time, the statute of limitations and the time constraints, there really is not a lot of recourse they have. And so, I mean, I'm hoping we can learn from this and know that if there's a tragedy, you know, um, if there's a huge event, um, like Louisiana, for example, there are going to be people who way down the road are going to need things and we need to think, be a little more forward thinking in terms of disaster about reserving some of the onslaught of funds that comes in for, for future use. We need to take a second break. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Educational Forum where we're talking with Marion Fontana. Marian, how is your son Aiden? He's doing very well. He's finishing fourth grade. He's 10 years old and you know kids are remarkably resilient. He's uh, happy and his life is full and he has a lot of questions now that he didn't have before because he's older and understands a lot more. Um, he asked to read my book recently which was you know a little scary but interesting and um, I think, you know, really understands fully now what has happened in a way he didn't when he was five. So, um, but he's, you know, he's remarkably resilient and has a lot of life force and he's very happy. So I'm thrilled. And Mike, how happy we are. He's doing well. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what was the process like to actually write the book? I mean, it was hard enough to have experienced all this, but mm. then to have to explain it to others or to just your, some of your most personal thoughts about the whole issue. Yeah, it was very challenging. I was very conflicted about whether I even wanted to write a book um, because I didn't want to exploit Dave in any way and I didn't want to exploit the situation. But then my brother-in-law actually made the case that, you know, you've been a writer for 15 years. Dave supported you in your writing and you should write this book. And so I did. And it was really, really hard. I would have to say next to losing Dave, it was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done to have to go back and and some days I would look at it and I go, I can't believe this is my life, that it looks like science fiction, you know, that, you know, that they attacked the city and then all this happened. And so it was very surreal to kind of step back. But I also think it helped my grieving process. It really helped me kind of have some closure. I feel really grateful that I wrote it now that my son's reading it and that he has this as a way of remembering Dave and, and what happened to us. So. I'm glad I did it, <laughs> as hard as it was. <laughs> Marion, tell us a little bit about your work with the Tribute Center, the museum, and the tours. Well, I've um, we kind of reevaluated how, after the site closed, obviously our organization wasn't as necessary, um, and so we kind of reevaluated and wondered if we could be useful in any other way. And what we decided was that um, one of the firefighters who lost his son and was a retired firefighter. Uh, would give these informal tours of the site just to anyone visiting or firefighters that came from other countries and and he was so touching and, and good at it I mean it really seemed to make a difference when he told people his personal experience about being at the site and recovery um, that you know we decided to formalize it and I said you know we should really with just thousands of people coming to the site looking at an empty hole they don't really know what's happened it's kind of confusing where the buildings were you know, we should have tours. And so that's what we did. We gathered the 9-11 community of people who survived, the, um, ran out of the buildings, residents who lived there, small business owners who watched it unfold, um, and their businesses then collapsed. Um, we got them all together, rescue workers, volunteers, everyone, to start um, going through a training program, a docent training program. And, and they offer tours to people visiting around the site and give a very personal account. And while that's happening, we're also under construction for a tribute center, um, which is a, will be a temporary visitor center for people to come and learn about <coughs> what happened and <coughs> the towers before 9/11 and what you know how it was a vital community and what it was like there and, and the events of the day and the aftermath. And so we're, that should be opening in August. So we've been very busy with that too. 
Well, we thank you and we wish you the best as well, I think you. you know in that endeavor. Well, thank you. Mike, you have said that really bad things can happen to really good people and it's how you deal with those things that will determine whether you survive or whether you do well in life. Would you tell us what you're thinking? Yeah, uh, a lot of that philosophy actually probably is a result of my mother, um, who always had a very positive outlook on life and who said, uh, everything happens for a reason. That was her philosophy, is that uh, you had to deal with things and uh, <coughs> persevere, as Marion has. Um, and so I guess it's sort of a recognition that's been beaten into me <laughs> over the last 50 years mm -hmm. that you have to deal with what's on your plate. And sometimes, I mean, extraordinarily bad things happen to really great people. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference with how we live then, and that's what it is about living, not surviving, is the ability to deal with those in a very positive fashion. And I think no one could have done Many people couldn't have done what you did, hmm. but uh, most of us could not have done it better. Yeah, um, and, and, and I think that's sort of the philosophy. Like, uh, as I get older, I learned my mother was a very, very wise philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> Marion, what's next for you? Well, I'm working on a second book. I'm, I'm looking forward to writing more comedic pieces, <laughs> 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 going to the other extreme um, of what I used to be, you know, which was... Uh, a comedian and and I've always maintained my sense of humor throughout my life even through this tragedy there's a lot of humor in my book and but I miss that part of myself that really focuses on on the funnier side of life so I'm writing some essays in the second book about you know the funnier side of things and I'm working on some theater pieces as well as being involved in my organization so I have my plate pretty full <laughs> and I must tell you in your book I enjoyed the humor a lot oh thank that you it's great <laughs> Before we go to our graduation ceremony tonight, I'd like to close this segment of the show by reading from your memorial service to Dave. You say, Dave strove to live his life fully, to love his family and friends, to feel his feelings, to be honest, and to be a good man. I think he accomplished that. I hope everyone here will use Dave's life as an example. I know I will. So tell the people around you that you love them. Men grudges, don't stay angry with people, and be kind. It is rare that one has the opportunity to introduce a speaker who has dedicated a significant portion of her life to helping, to being an advocate for other people. But today's speaker, Marian Fontana, has done exactly that since September 11th, 2001. Previously and still a writer and performer, she lost her husband on 9-11, and since then has, in many ways, helped widows, firefighters, and others who suffered. She has helped them to cope, has advocated for their economic interests, and has been a public face for the victims of the tragedy. She is also the author of A Widow's Walk, a memoir of 9-11 which discusses both the personal side and the public side of the awful event. Ladies and gentlemen, I am privileged to present to you today's commencement speaker, Marion Fontana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, go on, sit down. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome students, professors, family, and friends. I'm deeply honored to be here today to share this amazing stepping stone in your lives. I'm especially grateful to receive this honorary law degree. While you toiled in academia and struggled in side jobs to be here today, I just took the math turnpike from Andover. <laughs> Few things in life are this easy, and so I thank you. My parents thank you. They are very proud to finally have a lawyer in the family. And so I begin my law career by making your commencement speech today. This is not an easy task. I researched literally dozens of commencement addresses. Some were touching, some were funny, but most, let's face it, were boring. 
filled with platitudes and advice I do not feel qualified to give you. And so I will speak from the place I know best, which is my own life experience. As I sat at my own commencement address just a few years ago, <laughs> I had many dreams, aspirations, and goals. I imagined my life, as many do, with a successful career, relationship, marriage, home, children. Before 9-11, I was working hard to make these goals happen. I married my college sweetheart, a handsome sculpture major who was a lifeguard in the summer. We moved into Manhattan, where I wrote one-woman shows, plays, and screenplays. I perform performed off-Broadway, did commercials, bit parts, and movies. For money, I worked literally dozens of jobs to make ends meet. I taught gymnastics, performed in schools, taught special ed, nursery school, latchkey kids. I waitressed at dozens of restaurants, answered phones at a law firm even. Goldstein, Farrell, Schindler, and Garbus, how may I help you? I even drove a cab. But being a starving artist was difficult, and when I didn't get the part or a play I wrote was rejected, Dave urged me on. Why take the trip if you're not going to enjoy the ride, he'd say. Dave got called to join the Fire Academy in the fall of 1991. What began as a job to have time to sculpt soon became Dave's passion. He loved firefighting and felt blessed he had found his calling. We moved to Park Slope, Brooklyn, where Dave worked in a historic firehouse in a brownstone neighborhood, and our son Aiden was born a few years later. We named him Aiden because it meant little fire in Irish, and we were overwhelmed by the fierce love we felt for him. I continued to write and perform, struggling to balance the tray of motherhood, day jobs, auditions, writing, theater, friends, and family. But what I didn't realize then is that I had achieved success long ago. Then kept, came September 11th, my eighth wedding anniversary, the day my husband and best friend never came home, the day we all changed forever. The world called Dave a hero for running into the towers and saving thousands of lives. I will forever be proud of what Dave did that day. But to me, Dave was a hero for being my partner for 17 years, for the small acts of kindness he showed people every day, the way he smiled at strangers when they passed, or pulled the neighborhood kids in Aiden's wagon, how he always held the door open for people and overtipped the waitress, or sang softly to my son at bedtime. When people die, it is not the big moments you remember. It's the seemingly insignificant way Dave wheezed slightly when he laughed, or how he noticed the way the earth smelled different in the fall. If you can notice these small moments and breathe them in, even for a second on your way to the courtroom or the office or where, wherever life leads you, then you have already achieved great success. After my husband died, my neighborhood in Park Slope rallied around me, shoring me up like a falling tree. The women made lasagnas and bought, brought me tissues. The men took my son out to play baseball. I didn't have the heart to tell them, these well-meaning well fathers, that my husband Dave was probably the only firefighter in the country that had absolutely no interest in sports. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to explain this when they signed him up for Little League in Prospect Park in the spring. Even though Aiden looked bored, collapsing onto the field, picking at the grass or his nose, depending on his mood, <laughs> the dads were very patient. Good job, buddy, they would say, or keep your eye on the ball, but it was futile. I wanted to stand idly by, to be one of those placid moms that read The New Yorker, encouraging their child with a silent smile, but I turned into something else. All my fears for Aiden, my need for him to feel like the other boys, turned me into a sports equivalent of a stage mom. I yelled, cheered, stomped in ways I'm embarrassed about now. Aiden, pay attention! I would scream in the rare moments the ball would actually make its way to Aiden's end of the field practically running onto the grass to catch it myself. I clapped hard when our players hit the ball and secretly gloated when we won. I became the kind of mother they make after school specials about. <laughs> I constantly told Aiden he was a great hitter, despite the fact that he ran the wrong way and yelled touchdown when he returned to home plate. <laughs> Two years later, we crossed the Verrazano Bridge for a new life on Staten Island. I vowed never to do baseball again, signing Aiden up for karate instead. 
It was the perfect sport for him. There was no team. They meditate, encourage community, and beat the crap out of each other. I take Aiden to class, go next door to Starbucks and write. There are no games on weekends, no cold mornings in the bleachers. I don't yell. Life is simple, and we are slowly healing. But recently, word spread that Aiden was fatherless and teamless, and so once again, dads began knocking on my door. And so I have spent this last month perched on benches once again, screaming at the top of my lungs for two games a week and a practice on Friday. Aiden's lack of talent is more pronounced now since most of the boys have been playing since we stopped. It doesn't help that Aiden is the tallest boy, his uniform tight, his long wavy brown hair poking from the side of his too small hat. At the game last week, on a warm light green spring day, Aiden yelled, look mom, a cardinal, pointing to a brilliant red speck on top of the chain link fence surrounding the field. Fontana, glove in front, the coach yelled and I heard a crack and noticed a ball sailing toward Aiden, but he was still looking at the bird, who was now perched on top of the scoreboard. I forced myself not to scream. I heard the first base coach whisper to the head coach that Aiden sucked, and my heart ached to protect him from all of it, from missed balls and mean people, from being fired or broken up with, from loved ones in hospital beds and unbearable loneliness. I just wanted him to keep staring at that bird, because we both know that it could fly away at any moment. A few weeks ago, I was reading the New York Times about another young life lost on September 11th. An employee from Cantor Fitzgerald, Ann Nelson, would have been 35 on May 17th. Recently, her laptop was sent to her parents. They didn't know how to use a computer, so they waited to open it when they finally found the strength to turn it on and one of their art students taught them how to use it, there was a list of a hundred things to do, a catalog of goals. It began, one, be healthy, healthful. Two, make a quilt. Three, Nepal. Four, learn a foreign language. Five, never be ashamed of who I am. Six, read every day. Seven, volunteer for a charity. Eight, Grand Canyon. Nine, appreciate money, but don't worship it. 10, learn about wine. Anne's list was unfinished, and I'm sure you graduates have lists of your own. I wish for all of you to do something on your list, however big or small, to see the Cardinal. The media calls it a post 9-11 world now, and I am sorry that you, the class of 2006, are a part of this frightening time of war, terrorism, and a fragile earth. But in my post 9-11 world, I saw something else. I watched the facades of people fall away and sighed as they hugged in the streets, lit candles, wrote songs, and placed flowers at firehouse doors. After 9-11, scared and humbled, people called to action the very best of themselves. Children from all over the country sent us teddy bears, drawings, taping their allowances to pieces of paper. People banded together in a thousand small acts of kindness and out of the ashes, a new spirit was born. I watched us hold tighter to our families, reevaluate what matters, and this buoyed me through my dark hours of grief. The moment faded too fast as we entered into a misguided war and endless challenges for our future, but I saw the best of humanity, the essence of who we can be, and know that it exists in all of you. Our wounds are our best lessons, our life's biggest teachers, and I have seen powerful love that has changed me forever. It has made me try to walk in other shoes, show more compassion and humility. I believe more than ever in social justice, and losing my husband has made me fearless and care less of what others think. I recognize that I'm a work in progress, that I will make many mistakes, and I will try to learn from them. And though I sit with politicians and speak on television, I know that it is the small, tender moments in my life that make me who I am. I think that is why I am especially honored to speak at the Massachusetts School of Law, because I am impressed by its unique acceptance policies. The school looks at the whole person, not only accepting students on their grades or their ability to pay, but on their commitment, their striving for better. I hope you will use these principles to guide you on your path through life. In closing, I would like to offer up a final quote 
I found it taped to my desk in those early days of my career when I was struggling, despairing over yet another rejection letter. Dave had taped it there to inspire me, and it does to this day. It is a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, and I'll paraphrase. It is not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. You, you graduates are all in the arena today. My heartiest congratulations to all, all of you, the class of 2006. Thank you so much.